So she was interested in how little light it would take to to um, get an entrainment to 24 hours. And yeah. then she started pulsing them with light. And then from that, she uh, eventually would pulse them in subjective yeah. day, subjective night. So you're recording now? Yeah. yeah okay, recording. good. So, yeah. So um, sure. maybe maybe actually uh, uh, related to this was would be if if you could tell me a little bit about B. Z. Sweeney. Oh, B. Z. was a wonderful person and a and a, a real uh, <coughs> a real keen enthusiastic. She loved her work so much. Uh, I don't know if you know it. She got her degree in this department in the late '30s with Ken Tiemann, who later went who. Re <coughs> retired from Harvard at the age of 60 and, and went and began the founding of U University of California, Santa Cruz. But she did work on uh, his area with the oat coleoptile uh, phototropism. Uh, she didn't do any, to my recollection, she didn't do more after that. Uh, she started having children and had a big family. In fact, she had two husbands. Well, she had more than two, but the not at the had, same time. No, <laughs> but she had <laughs> children with two different husbands. Uh, I guess is that right? I'm not sure. Uh, I but think you better cut all that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. But she had been working with Hexo. She uh, Hexo, who I uh, knew very well, of course, because he had been at Hopkins when I was a postdoc and he had the lab next to me so I got to know him for quite well. He allowed her to use space in his lab. He never did much, he never had much interest in having her work with him. And when I came along, uh, which is a complicated thing, but uh, I was at a meeting, the first meeting on bioluminescence uh, ever. We didn't, before the 50s there were, there were only international congresses or, or society meetings. There weren't really these sort of special meetings on topics. And this was organized by Harvey and Frank Johnson from Princeton uh, and was a group of about 30 people who went to a Silomar. Uh, Sweeney uh, <coughs> had been doing, uh, had been working in Hacksaw's lab. He gave her space. And she did the first isolation of a dinoflagellate, first culturing of a dinoflagellate, grew it in the lab and was able to see the bioluminescence, which is not why she isolated it. She was interested in, in the whole phenomenon of, of biology of algae and, and so forth. Uh, but they then saw that it gave a different amounts of light at different times of day. And they came to this bioluminescence meeting in a Silomar and presented that. And actually, he presented the data. So he had kind of co-opted the situation a little bit, uh, but uh, friendly, in a friendly way, I think. Um, so I said, oh my gosh, here's a, another bioluminescence system. Uh, I had no particular interest in the rhythm aspect of it, although I was uh, an instructor at, in Frank Brown's department at the time. So I certainly knew about uh, biological rhythms, which Frank Brown was, of course, pushing very hard. Except so, Brown was pushing it with the perspective that it was driven by some geophysical factor yes, rather than endogenous. Yes, yes. But at this point, um, Sweeney's and, uh, observation was under light-dark conditions, and it had she had not yet started to look at whether it would persist in constant That's right. They had not done anything like that. Um, and, of course, I also had been a graduate student at Princeton, where Pittendrake had come the same year I did, but as an assistant professor, but he was basically our age, or we, he behaved our age anyway, and we, uh, all the graduate students were very much a part of Pittendrake's uh, entourage and so forth. And he, he had not done any experiments on Drosophila. I left in 1951, so his first publication was 54. So he hadn't actually done any experiments, but he's very interested in this from his, 
from his uh, work in Trinidad where the mosquitoes uh, had rhythms of activity and different levels of the forest had different phase angles for the, uh, for the circadian. And he used to talk about this with me and, and say, what kind of biochemistry could give a rhythm? Uh, other biochemical systems. I was working with oxygen and knew that and found examples of oscillations, of biochemical oscillations in my records while in my experiments. When I changed the concentration of something, I, I'd often see them overshoot, undershoot, overshoot, under, and then damp out. But that's only, you know, for either seconds or minutes at the most. Uh, and it didn't seem to be relevant to the 24-hour question. Back to Sweeney. So uh, I said, uh, gee, I would love to isolate the, the biochemistry of, of that system. It was already well known uh, in, uh, at that time that uh, different bioluminescent systems had different evolutionary origins. Uh, that was known from the biochemistry, not from the genes. We now know it from the genes. So uh, Francis Hexall was, of course, in charge of the lab, and he he said, sure, you can come. And uh, so uh, I came uh, a little over a year later. So this, uh, the conference was in, uh, was in 54, yeah, and I came, conference was in March 54, I came in, in June 55. And, uh, and Hacksaw was away for the summer, so he, he let us live in his house. So he went to Hopkins? I don't think so. I think he went somewhere else that summer. No, but, but you went, you said you came, was it to Scripps or to Hopkins? The Scripps. I said he, Scripps. Yeah, he was okay. never at so Hopkins. No. As a, so, well, he was at Hopkins because he worked with Blinks. So he must have done, yeah, he was at Hopkins years before then. He worked with Larry Blinks. Do you know that name? Mm -hmm. Very, very extraordinary guy. Uh, anyway, so where are we? So you joined Sweeney because you wanted to work on the biochemistry of the luminescence, yeah. and the rhythmicity was an observation that she had made, but your primary interest was in how the luminescence was generated. And first off, yeah, I was able to successfully isolate the luciferase and the luciferin of this system, uh, which other people had tried, uh, as I understand it, uh, but had not succeeded, but they didn't have, probably didn't have enough uh, material being able to culture it, and we, I could harvest flasks full of it. Have you seen my, the flasks of my? I've seen pictures. Oh, I should show you. When we oh, maybe we could get that on video. I think you can get it on video. Really need to be, to yeah, be in the sure. Um, yeah, uh, right. Well, we should do that fairly early on, so that uh, because they're on a cycle, and I, uh, they're close to the mid midnight portion of the thing Turn right it. now. Do that now? Sure, we could go ahead and do that now. All right, so now we're going to go look at bioluminescence. Right. Uh, so here is how we, we, we put cultures like this in here. And this is the photomultiplier, which moves position to each position. When it's on top of there, those cultures are in the dark. Uh, and therefore the photomultiplier can measure the amount of spontaneous luminescence that they're giving. Uh, <coughs> they give more luminescence if you shake them, as you saw, but they also give luminescence uh, if they're not shaken. And we had to design this and build this carefully so that it didn't make much agitation. <coughs> and we used to use a scintillation counter which uh, measures radioactivity, as you know. Uh, and those transport the vial from one position to another, therefore they tend to shake things. And we get still useful data, but it, uh, we wanted the data of absolutely spontaneous light emission, and that's what we have. And is the, maybe you could talk a bit about the flashing rhythm versus the glow rhythm. Yeah, there's, there's two rhythms. One is a flashing rhythm and one is a glow rhythm. They have different phase angles, so they peak at different times of day. Uh, the flashing rhythm is the true biologically relevant rhythm, flashing. The glow is a, uh, about, ten to, about a million times dimmer than a flash. But if you have a, a lot of cells there, you can add it up. A flash, you see it from an individual cell. Uh, but the glow, you can sum, you, when you measure it, you, you're summing all of the cells in the, 
in a culture. And typically, there might be uh, you know twenty or thirty thousand cells in a culture like that. So, so um, I actually. For the film, I have some pictures of uh, Pittendrig's bang boxes. Yes. You wouldn't happen to have like your original, one of your original apparatus for... Uh, no, but I do have a picture. Okay, so <coughs> you had gone out to Scripps and uh, Sweeney had uh, described... So Sweeney was, Sweeney was uh, an unpaid volunteer who came into the lab between driving children to <laughs> whatever <laughs> piano lessons uh, and did all this culturing and got the down and and then started measuring them uh, and uh, measuring the bioluminescence and, and made that observation that is published in that in that uh, report of that conference so I came out in, interested primarily in uh, the bioluminescence system the, the the luciferase and the luciferin and how the mechanism was, but not unmindful of the biological rhythm that they that they had. So I was very keen on on looking into that with her as well. But I first did the biochemistry and within a month had successfully isolated the fractions and uh, published that paper concurrently with the first rhythm paper that we published again. That was a couple of years later. It didn't come out to 57, and this was partly due, uh, I've always thought, to the fact that the editor of that was a man named Arthur Parpart, uh, who was a professor at Princeton, uh, with whom I had not been particularly uh, friendly uh, during my time there. But I think that he uh, wanted to, to, to just sort of be sure that this was okay, and he may have consulted with Pitt and Drake and taking more time than he needed to. So I submitted that. It was it took uh, more than a year for it to be published, which at that time I think was not necessary. Anyway, so... And, uh, yeah. Also at, at, at Princeton you must have <coughs> interacted with Victor Bruce. Some? Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, Victor came uh, uh, after I left, so... Uh, I didn't know him when I was there, and, but I I got to know him very quickly. And very, and he's you know he's still li he lives on Martha's Vineyard. Have you gotten to interview him? I spoke to him on the phone. I, yeah, I might get out there in the summer and interview him. Not yeah, sure. yeah, I think you should. I, he, he's. I mean, I think he put the notion that uh, of of an oscillator. He was an engineer. Uh, he brought the, the notion of an oscillator to the to the field. Uh, and I always interpreted an oscillator as a pendulum, which is about as complicated as I could get. And of course, uh, well, let's let's do that later because you wanted to ask about how we did the rhythms in La Jolla. So in La Jolla we did, you said, how did I come to the point of putting them in constant dim light? Well, it was just Plain logic. We had we had done the experiment of putting them in constant light, and it damped the rhythm, so you could no longer see them. We put them in darkness; they would last three or four cycles and then die. And it just seemed logical to to try a, a dim light, and see if the if the inhibition would be less, since we interpreted the loss of rhythm is some kind of inhibition, that it, the inhibition might be less and you might see it. And of course, that did work. And uh, So uh, now, um, earlier uh, work in rhythms, like, I don't know if you know Maynard Johnson's work on... I do. I, I have copies of his. Yeah. Yeah. Because he had, he had described, I think in 39, about how bright light would make the, the animal arrhythmic. A rat or mouse. It a rat, a paramiscus, I think. yeah. Yeah, paramiscus. Uh, that's right. Yeah, right. And, and he he works in this department. <laughs> <laughs> so and was that at all? I think actually he was in Illinois when he did that. But he was. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But 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 did, did was that in your mind at all when you saw that? No, I didn't all? know of his work at all. Of course, it was a animal a mam mammalian f literature. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. He he showed the effect of light. Didn't he show the effect of light intensity on tau? Yeah, that's right. 
He, s he yeah. showed that with, with brighter light, measured, of course, in foot candles, as was it? done in those days, yeah. that you got a lengthening of period and then a rhythmicity when you made it bright enough. And that was probably not uh, re referred to in Ashoff's early work, was it? I don't know. I don't think so. Because I wrote a review and, and read Ashoff's work carefully and did that experiment. Uh, well, that experiment is in the the 58 biological bulletin paper for our system. So I'm not sure if if I actually had if I had actually I had read Ashoff's. No, I don't think I had. Ashoff first visited Illinois in 58, but that would have been after my paper. So I didn't know Ashoff before 58. Uh, okay, so when, once you had gone into dim constant light. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you saw the effects of intensity on period, and then you, you were in dim constant light, and then you were doing bright flashes or dark pulses. Uh, go ahead. At different phases. Oh, you mean the, 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 the circuit? Yeah. As I as I started to say, I always thought of, of a rhythm from the sort of Bruce Bruce concept as a as a oscillator that swings back and forth. And you know, if you hit the if you hit the pendulum anywhere, at one point you can make it go in advance, and at another point it'll be uh, a, 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 a delay. So it seemed like a, a obvious model to just go hit this with a pulse of light, and a pulse, we, I guess I use two hour exposures, maybe something like that. It seemed to me they had to be reasonably short in, in relation to the full cycle, because you couldn't hold your hand on the pendulum for too long and really cause it a, call it a perturbation. So, yeah, that's how, how I got how I got interested in that idea and did those experiments. And <laughs> I, I hadn't realized at all that, that Victor Bruce was an engineer and had that idea of, of, of an oscillator from an engineering background. Well, I do, think... Do you remember I, discussing it with him? And well, uh, yes. Uh, the, the, that he was an engineer, you mean? I don't think I... I don't remember that, but I, I think he had an engineering background. Uh, but because that, that's what surprised me in the Euglena work was that they were not doing PRCs in the '57 yeah. paper. And if he was an engineer, I would have thought he would have quickly done a PRC. And 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 De Courcy actually also said that she did her PRC before Pittenberg did any PRCs. I think that's right. Yeah. Well, it just surprises me. It just seems. Yeah. 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 Well, certainly for any oscillator, it's very evident. I mean, even a even non-mechanical oscillator, I mean, uh, electronic circuits, you can immediately, intuitively understand that if you change one of the parameters, it will change the, the phase. Yeah. Well. The fascinating thing is, is, is that you know what what seems obvious to us now. Yeah, right. Maybe wasn't so obvious. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well have you ago. have you read the paper uh, by Pittendrig and Bruce? They wrote two papers, long papers, in the fifty six, fifty seven. Uh, one was from a. A symposium held at Scripps uh, before I went out there. So, uh, but the paper was not published for a couple, of, two or three years. It was a, a long time. They may, they may have ideas like that in there. Uh, well, um, <coughs> first of all, uh, one thing that you're concerned about with 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 your work with Sweeney, and that I know Pittendrick was concerned about, and actually. Uh, I interviewed uh, Lincoln Brower. I don't know if you overlapped with him at Princeton. No. But he was an undergraduate working with uh, Pitt yeah. in 52 or 53. Yeah. And, and he said that Pitt was really focused on temperature compensation. Yeah. yeah. And um, in, in your 50 Years of Fun paper, you make very uh, clear that the endogenous exogenous uh, debate was really revolving around Q10 issues. Yeah, and that and 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 Brower said that Pitt wasn't even really thinking about entrainment by light in the in the early fifties. Uh -huh. at, at at least, in, I think maybe 
we should talk a little bit about how important it was to establish temperature compensation as opposed to temperature cycle control or temperature independence is what Pitt, Pitt was he really called it temperature independence and had not thought about the idea of temperature compensation and, until I used that term in, in my paper in, in 57 where we found a Q10 less than one or uh, not a Q10 less than one, a Q, a Q, uh, temperature coefficient less than one where higher temperatures slowed down the clock. And so I put in this model of two, two loops, two, two, re two steps or two reactions opposing each other, both with positive temperature coefficients. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that his, his, he had not, he had not, I guess, uh, tried to think of what, what the mechanism of temperature compensation would be. I'm wrong on that. He, he, he had D, he tried D2O, the famous D2O experiment. He, he <laughs> confessed to me later that he did that because he thought that might uh, reveal what the mechanism of temperature compensation, what our temperature independence was. It was in Drosophila? Uh, uh, was it in Drosophila? No, it was in Euglena. Yeah. I think that's in the Cold Spring Harbor uh, paper mm -hmm. uh, volume. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's remarkable that you know, having been trained by Dubjansky and being comfortable with Jasofka and having this background <coughs> before that of working with mosquitoes, that Pitt fell into working with unicellulars. <coughs> that was that did, was did, by way of. Yeah. I don't know how he came came to that. He was not doing that when I was there, at all. Um, and then maybe that's Bruce that brought that in. Uh, you might ask Vic about that, how he got into Euglena. And I think Vic was the first author on the Euglena papers, actually. Uh, so he, he very well may have done that. Yeah. But uh, I would imagine that from very early on, by working with the unicellular, the thought process may have been that we can get to the molecular basis of the oscillator. But you mean Pitt? Well, Pitt, you. Uh, every, you know, oh yeah, the, the I mean certainly from my point of view that was the the, the goal. But uh, as you just said, as we were walking in the hall, uh, early on I was able to show that in fact the luciferase and the luciferin were not part of the oscillator. By well, I mean. Yeah, by experiments in which I changed the amount of, of the cellular amount of luciferin uh, in the, and that's in that 58 paper, um, by exhausting the system, therefore luciferin would be very low. If it was part of the, of the loop, then you should have a phase shift. And we didn't get one. So, uh, and we did the same thing with photosynthesis uh, and, and showing that that also was not the, uh, part of it, so that we inhibited the photosynthesis system with DCMU, blocked photosynthesis for a period of time, then relieved the inhibition, and the, the rhythm came back in phase. So that, to me, already m meant that there were elements, con a di distinction between the clock uh, biochemistry and the chemistry of control processes controlled by the clock. So, of course, uh, that's taken up in many systems thereafter. Uh, CCG is clock control genes, which Jennifer Loris has, has done a lot on in, uh, in Neurospora. But, uh, yeah. So now, of course, um, the students will know that the, the, the 50s, you know, from the Watson and Crick 53 paper was an explosive period in molecular biology. And we had the Cronon model that came out around 1960 or so. Earlier, uh, bah, bah, bah. go ahead. Right. Yeah, well, I'm just interested in, if you can recall, you know, you're thinking about how to fit in the new information about the structure of genes and emerging information about transcription and how that was fitting in or what you were thinking about as you were observing uh, rhythms in a single cell and whether 
you were making transcriptional models or thinking about translational products influencing transcription? Well, certainly by 1960, uh, we were at that point and, uh, and started, and you may remember that we had been frustrated by not finding any inhibitors, on typical inhibitors of metabolism that would f phase shift the clock. And uh, one of the things that I always designed my experiments using inhibitors as pulses, so which you can do with the unicell because you can add the inhibitor, let it sit there for an hour, and then centrifuge the cells and resuspend in fresh medium. So that was a, the design of all mine, my experiments. I think to the extent that people did inhibitor experiments, they simply added inhibitors and looked for, for uh, and left them in. Uh, and that's true of the, of the Euglena study that Jerry Feldman did uh, with uh, cyclohexamide. And however, he was able to see if an, a, an effect there, uh, but he didn't show a phase shift. As I recall the data, he did, didn't, didn't look for phase shift. Later, we showed phase shifts with cyclohexamide. But in 1960, we started working with inhibitors of macromolecular synthesis of DNA and of protein uh, uh, synthesis and used a whole variety uh, of inhibitors, including actinomycin D, which <coughs> was not really well understood at the time what it did, but it was known to inhibit DNA-dependent RNA synthesis. So that's essentially what was thought of as messenger at that point. Uh, uh, and of course, messenger wasn't defined until uh, as in the, uh, using that word until a couple of years later, but it had already been seen by uh, Astrakhan and Fogel uh, as a uh, as a, pr a product in the in the late 50s. In any event, we did actinomycin D and showed that it would completely block the rhythm. So they were just absolutely, and this was <coughs> added continuously, uh, and trying to take it out again didn't. Uh, stop it. So it was a r irreversible effect. So that said, the rhythm can be blocked by something that involves the synthesis of RNA. We then went to protein synthesis and were completely confounded because some protein synthesis inhibitors completely blocked the clock. Uh, and, and chloramphenicol, which was the most well known protein synthesis inhibitor at the time, had, a, uh, had an enhancing effect upon the rhythm. It made it get three or four times uh, the amplitude much, much greater, beautiful, and it got two peaks a day instead of one. Now you could go look at control data and see a little minor second peak, so we thought, well, that may be happening there. In any event, it wasn't known then that uh, the 70S and 80S ribosomes are different, uh, are different species, and uh, we were inhibiting 70S ribosomes from bacteria and not inhibiting the uh, the eukaryotic, which Jerry Feldman then was able to show with, uh, with the cyclohexamide, and thus later uh, all of the inhibitors of uh, of ADS uh, ribosome uh, uh, protein synthesis uh, phase shift like man. They're beautiful. So yeah. Okay. So so were, were you tempted to to shift to work on a prokaryote, or was it just that you didn't have a luminescent one that discouraged you? Uh, Walter Taylor, who's worked, done an enormous amount of work in my laboratory, did his thesis on cyanobacteria, trying to demonstrate a rhythm. He had some data that looked very suggestive. Uh, uh, we never published it. Uh, it wasn't good enough, to, in my view, to publish, uh, but it was not till later when Carl Johnson came and he said, you know, well, by then uh, Mitsui and, the, and a Chinese group had, had demonstrated that cyanobacteria do have it. But Walter Taylor's thesis in the 70s, which is still on the shelf, uh, has page after page of data on Eukaryotes. Yeah. No, I was just thinking that, I mean, here you are in the 50s working on goniolics as yeah. genetics. Yeah. It's complicated as a eukaryote. Yeah. And that it would have been logical to go immediately to, to a bacteria. Yeah. Well, 
you know, nobody could find circadian rhythms in bacteria uh, until 1985. Uh, unless you, in retrospect, you can look at Walter's, Taylor's experiments and then you say, aha, uh -huh, yeah, that, it was there. He was me measuring oxygen uptake. So that's uh, clumsy and uh, not very sensitive thing, so. Uh, you need a convenient endpoint. You, you need uh, you need what they got. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you, uh, what they finally did was to, to have a reporter gene. So the first, we, we had already cloned the bacterial luciferase, so they just used that uh, to attach to uh, uh, a reporter, I mean, to a gene, which uh, the bacterial luciferase served as a reporter. So I think that's still the only major <coughs> work that uses bacterial luciferase, whereas most of the sort of reporter constructs that are used by people around the world are firefly. Uh, and, uh, yeah. I, I find that uh, it's something that it has to be explained carefully to students, and maybe since you're authoritative on it, uh, we could get it on tape about explaining the difference between an endogenous uh, luminescence that you can use to observe rhythmicity as you do in Gani Olax versus using luciferase as a reporter and introducing it into some organism to follow the, the uh, time course of gene expression. Yes, well, uh, straightforward. In the first case, that is an endogenous luminescence system, this is like any other uh, <coughs> A biochemical system in a living cell that's, that has a uh, circadian component that's controlled by by the clock, uh, and so it's a simple matter. Uh, simple. It's a matter of the uh, uh, <coughs> of the biochemistry of that system being regulated by the clock so that it it is emits light at one time of day and not at another time of day. There's not enough knowledge yet of of all the systems that including Gani Alex, including the dinoflagellates, to know um, exactly how the clock uh, links to the biochemistry of the luminescence. Uh, but you do know, or we do know, that for example, fireflies do not flash in, <coughs> in, in the daytime. Even if you put them in a dark room, they don't flash. You can put, this experiment was done in the 30s of putting fireflies in a, in a, in a, dark room of this size, so that it was a big enough room so they could fly around, they didn't flash. And the, re the rhythm of that was recorded. But that's not at the biochemical level. That uh, the biochemistry, if you grind up a firefly in the daytime, you still get the luciferase and the luciferin. The thing that we found that was striking in the 1955, uh, published 57 work that we did, the first on the biochemistry was that if we harvested those gonialex in the daytime, ground them up, there was no luciferase there. So this was an absolutely extraordinary finding that a whole protein system would be inactive at one time of day and active at another. For many years, I felt sure that, that the luciferase was there day and night, and it was somehow turned on and off. And we now know that Phosphorylation is a wonderful way to do that for many proteins. So it was with big surprise when 1980, we finally cracked, after many graduate students and postdocs had worked on this problem, we finally cracked the, the, <coughs> the puzzle and demonstrated that in fact the luciferase was gone in the daytime. It had absolutely been gone. Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Now your question was, how does that differ from a reporter gene luciferase? Well, that's very different. Uh, if, if you use luciferase as a reporter gene, you take the promoter of a gene, of a suspect gene, that you say, I want to follow what this gene is doing and know when it's being transcribed. So instead of having that particular promoter's <coughs> Uh, reading frame there, in place of that you put the reading frame of luciferase. And so you're measuring the, uh, the how that promoter is regulated, and again regulated by the clock, and again 
the steps between the clock and how it gets to the promoter or how it regulates the promoter is still an area of, of very heavy activity. Uh, so did I? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, on the on, on the one hand, it's 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 because uh, luminescence is so easily measurable that right. it makes goniolics a good preparation for right. just characterizing right. the clock and how to shift phase yeah, and all yeah. that. And it's that same property that makes it a good reporter. Right. Uh, but, you know, students get confused. It's just that, you know, I, I, I always find that I have to explain, um, you know, I mean, we read papers. I have students read, uh, you know, like Steve Kay's papers. And I ask them, well, so would you, would you expect you know, this, uh, you know, Drosophila wing or this fibroblast uh, fluoresce? And they say, sure, why not? <laughs> they don't really appreciate all the engineering that went into that yeah, and why right, he did right, it. Right, right, right. Okay, so you had known Frank Brown at Northwestern. Well, he was my boss. He hired me. <laughs> <laughs> but that was before you started looking at free-running rhythms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I went to Northwestern in 1953, September 53. So, yeah. And and can you recall his reaction to that work? Did you talk to him about what you were finding? I don't think I can give you an accurate <coughs> account of any reaction he might have had. He was very, very, very uh, focused on his own work. So every time I'd go into his office, he would grab me and show me his experiments and what he was recording. And he, he the fiddler crabs, fiddler crabs, potatoes, potatoes. <laughs> uh, you name it. Uh, he was just an absolute uh, uh, fiend, a madman, uh, in, in his and uh, work worked night and day, uh, and uh, yeah. So no, I I don't think I, I don't think he ever made any, any uh, comments negative or positive about our about my work and what it was was going on. Uh, you know. But I, I thought your comments were very interesting about about again back a little to temperature yeah. compensation yeah. dependence. Yeah. And and the idea that he had he had said uh, that Q10 was. One as evidence f for the idea that there's some geophysical. Yeah, yeah. Could you expand on that a little, and the, the importance of measuring temperature effects carefully to get into the endogenous exogenous. His his data uh, actually are conflicted to some extent. He I discovered abstracts from uh, <coughs> from annual meetings where he would submit a paper for discussion in which he actually uh, reported that the period was not exactly 24 hours. Uh, so, and he, he never accounted for that and never published it in a full paper. But the data are there, the, the report of the data are there. His, his view or his changed with time to be sure. Uh, the, the, the most famous change was when he uh, introduced the term autophasing, uh, and which I called phase saving, uh, <coughs> spelled F-A-C-E, <laughs> uh, and uh, that didn't set, that didn't uh, go down well with him. But uh, this was a way to account for free running uh, periods. So he believed that the actual signal was coming from some. Uh, Geophysical uh, phenomenon, and he he uh, at one point I can remember in the lab at Northwestern, he had had uh, uh, lead uh, coverings which uh, increases cosmic ray in, uh, intensity. How I'm not sure, but he was doing experiments to to try to show that cosmic rays might be. There are showers of cosmic rays uh, that occur in bursts, and uh, he, I suppose, hoped that he would be able to get a correlation with that and, and, and attribute it to that. 
and certainly in the different papers, which are extremely abundant with comments, I better, if you want to just turn that off for a second, I don't uh, that, that you didn't go back to the Northwestern or have exchanges with him? Well, I saw him every summer at Woods Hole for the next 30 years. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I, let's see, when did I, when did I, it's too bad that Lad Prosser has passed away. Did you know Lad Prosser? I didn't know. Him. Yeah, because he, he wrote these enormously big volumes, edited, I should say, on, uh,